Good morning, FOR 345. I'm broadcasting from the Soils Conference in the Forest Moon of Endor, where the expert soil samplers are Ewoks, and I will send them your good regards. Uh, we're here to talk about soil colloids and continue our other lecture, and so I thought it might be appropriate to perhaps review where we've been as we do at the beginning of each class and with the, the blast from the past. So we, last week, when I was back on campus, we talked about the factors influencing soil temperature. We talked about latitude, altitude, cover, slope, and aspect. We then advanced the soil thermal properties. We talked about lambda, which in the old uh, version is K, is here. And we talked about frost heaving and the three factors that contributed to frost heaving. And then we moved on to colloids. And we spend some time talking about the chemistry. We talked about equivalent weight and molecular weight and how to convert mass to charge because that was the unit for quantifying uh, colloidal chemistry, particularly cation exchange capacity. And we then kind of branched out in the types. And we left off talking about colloid types. We pretty much talked quite a bit about the organic types. And now we pick up there, and, and the story advances for the next 40 minutes. Okay. And so we, the second part of this was the mineral colloids, as opposed to the organic, the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. And now we go to the second part, the mineral colloids. So crystalline silicate clays, uh, this is one of the groups. They're also known as phyllosilicates. Know how to spell that, P-H-Y-L-L-O, phyllo or leaf-like. So we have these leaf-like silicates and these crystalline silicate clays. And remember where silicate clays come from. They come from aluminosilicates. Okay? And an example, we're going to talk about many, but a, a common one that we'll talk about, we'll begin with, is just kaolinite, one of the crystalline silicate clays or one of the phyllosilicates. Here's an illustration of kaolinite. It's out of the text, figure 8.3, and it just shows these beautiful flakes. And while this looks pretty nice and ordered, there's an amazing amount of chemistry here, and we're going to explore that and get into some of the external and internal surface area. Okay, so the mineral colloids, we have non-crystalline silica clays, the second group. Okay. So the crystalline and non-crystalline. And again, we're still silica clays, and the primary differentiation is crystalline versus non-crystalline. So well, some of these are referred to as short-range order, short range order minerals. Okay. And it has to do with how the pattern comes back in X-ray diffraction. Okay. And so these types of non-crystalline silica clays occur in volcanic ash, as well as some igneous rocks. And, and it's, it's more accurate to call them um, short range order than it is to call them amorphous. Uh, so you'll hear sometimes amorphous, but there's really there's some kind of very small amount of order, that there's some very small units that will, that will repeat in X-ray diffraction. Okay? And, and so the general form of these aluminosilicates, these non-crystallines, are aluminum, silicate, and water. Okay? And so this is just a very general form that shows their they're non-crystalline uh, aluminosilicates, and they're aluminum and silicates. Okay? And here are some of the versions. They are allophane and amogalite. And we talk about allophane as, uh, as, as one of these minerals, and amogalite. And amogalite sometimes called paracrystalline. So there's a little more short-range order, at, uh, slightly more, but still not, not a lot. And, and the really important aspect of this in terms of soil chemistry is that allophane and amogalite, these non-crystalline silica clays, they have a very high phosphate absorbing capacity. And note, I've got adsorbed, right? We talk about the surface phenomena, adsorbed. So with, under these materials, when you have these materials around, phosphate is really tightly absorbed to these types of clays. Here's a picture of allophane, and it's, uh, there's these little it's a little bit, uh, not quite amorphous, but short range order. And this is what it looks like, some of these, uh, some of the pattern of allophane. Okay. And short range order, so what that means is x-ray diffraction, when you pass x-rays through it and take them and you collect them in a detector, you get certain peaks that reflect a certain amount of order. And this is, this is a couple examples of, of that return from x-ray diffraction. And remember when we were talking about the introduction of colloids, we said it was 1850 when scientists kind of noticed that some of these salts stayed in the soils and some of these, um, and some of these anions left the soils when you leached them through. And, and it wasn't until the uh, 1950s when we had these patterns of this x-ray diffraction capability that we started to understand how this worked. And so this, this story kind of continues along, and this is very early, uh, early part of that story. 
here is a mogolite. So a mogolite is called, referred to as paracrystalline. Okay? And you can see it's, it's, there's an order in one direction, these kind of tubes. And it um, it's, has a slightly increased order than does allophane. It's kind of beautiful to see these tubes in this one dimension. Okay. So we're on the mineral colloids. We continue on. And the third group, iron and aluminum oxides and hydroxides. And these range all the way from crystalline to amorphous or uh, shapeless. Okay? And, and so you'll know iron, aluminum oxides, and hydroxides, we're kind of missing silica. And so this group is, things include goatite, that's F-E-O-O-H, okay? ferrohydrite, which gives soils their brown color, this gives soils their orange, um, yellow color, and hematite, of course, you know that is giving those red colors. So you'll note these are iron oxides, uh, iron oxides and hydroxides, and you don't see any uh, aluminum in there. Uh, sorry, you don't see any silica in there, and these are three of the most common ones. So I go down all the way to, oops, excuse me, up to gibbsite, and gibbsite is the aluminum one. So we have three iron oxides and gibbsite, and these are important components of these highly weathered systems. Okay, here's a picture of goatite. It gives this brown color. This is some of these goatite, goatite coatings on soil particles. Here's a picture of precipitated ferrohydrite. It gives soil this brown color. This is actually precipitating out. And you can see the brown lining this rock. And here's a picture of allophane. So we think about that and we want to think, what's the, what's the underlying way that these things are put together or constructed? And we've got to think, well, how could we build it? So now we start to think a little bit in depth about the structure and, and how these are built. And here's where we separate them out very much from the organic colloids. So remember, organic colloids, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and these rather interesting amalgamations. And now we're going to these crystalline silicate clays, the first group of our, uh, silica, of our crystalline clays. So also known as, so we talked about crystalline silica. What are crystalline silica clays also? We had another word for them. Do you remember what that was? It starts with a P, phyllosilicates. Now these are lacking these crystalline silica clays in some soil orders. Okay? And, and which ones? Okay? The intense weathering environments. Okay? Remember we talked sometime about the, when we talked about um, intense weathering, we talked about the soil order oxisol. So oxisols, these very highly weathered, high temperature, high precipitation areas are characterized by this soil order oxisols, uh, where silica is actually leached out of the profile. And we talked about that when we were talking about the, some of these development of these more forest floors. Okay? Volcanic environs, andesols, where most of the parent material is volcanic ash. Okay? You don't see crisp, many crystalline silica clays in those and organic environments. And where did we visit an organic soil? We went to the muck farm and out in the past Central Square, and we looked at histosols. So these are three soil orders we've said, we've talked about. I think when we talked originally about parent material, then we mentioned andesols. We've mentioned octosols, these very highly weathered, high temperature, high precipitation regions, stable old landscapes, and histosols. So these are three soil orders or you'll probably not find very much in the way of crystalline silicate clays. And, and the reason will it may become apparent as we discuss and learn how these things are built or put together on a molecular basis. So let, let's move toward that. So building silicate clays, we think what is the most fundamental unit? And there are two. And the first one I'll tell you about is the silica tetrahedron. Okay, so silica tetrahedron. So that's a tetrahedron. So this is a pyramid drawing in two dimensions, but it's, it would be a little Egyptian pyramid. And on the edges are oxygens, okay, coordinated covalently with a silicon in the middle. So this is a covalently bonded unit, a silicon tetrahedron, okay, and one of the basic structural components of these silicate clays. The other important unit for this is called an aluminum or a magnesium octahedron. Okay, aluminum octahedron, and it's, it's uh, six hydroxyls covalently coordinated around an aluminum and sometimes magnesium. Whether it's aluminum or magnesium, we'll get into some discussion about that. But for now, we have a silica tetrahedron and aluminum octahedron. Okay? And this is, these are the fundamental pieces that we stack together to make these clays. Kind of a neat idea, and so now we're going to actually build layers. 
So a quiz. What is the source of the net negative charge for organic colloids? What is the source of the net negative charge for organic colloids? Okay. And, and why this quiz? Because we're contrasting the mineral colloids. We talked about these in our first lecture. And so I'll leave you, that's the question I would like you to address and kind of bring back in your mind, what is the source of that net negative charge? And then let's contrast that. Let's contrast that to the source of the net negative charge for phyllosilicates. So if you, were, um, if you were listening and present last week, you would realize and would tell me that the source of the net negative charge in the organic colloids is what? The dissociation of hydrogen from the three groups, carboxyl, phenoly hydroxyl, and alcohol hydroxy. And that was the fundamental source of net negative charge expressed on the surface of these colloids that are organic. Now there's a big contrast when we move to the silicate clays and the phyllosilicates. And let's look at how they're built to kind of contrast that rather effectively. So here is the ball and stick model of the silica tetrahedron. And we start covalently putting this together. So here is silica. So these are covalently bonded. So, so we've, we're starting to build a sheet. So we have a silicon tetrahedron, silica tetrahedron, and we build these all across. And so you can envision these as a sheet. If we took and stuck these on the table with a ball and stick model, you could keep going. We could fill this table and, and have a sheet. Okay. Now, we can do the same with the aluminum octahedron. So here's the aluminum plus three, okay, and the six uh, hydroxyls. And if we start stacking them and joining them in a sheet, we could build a layer or a sheet of aluminum octahedrals. Okay? And so that's a fundamental piece. We could, again, I could cover this table with uh, this ball and stick model, and then I could start stacking these up. So now, when we talk about this, I want you to picture this ball and stick model laid out in a, in a layer, and we'll, we'll continue to show that. And, and so if we take that to the next step, and now we're going to represent, instead of those individual ball and stick models, I'm going to represent the covalently bonded thing, um, silica tetrahedrons in a tetrahedral sheet. I'm just going to write this as a tetrahedral sheet. Okay? And then I'm going to represent the octahedral sheet instead of ball and stick models as this layer. Okay. Oops, excuse me. And there's spacing in between. So here is a tetrahedral sheet bonded to an octahedral sheet with space in between. It repeats tetrahedral sheet, octahedral sheet. And so this is the fundamental difference among these silicate clay types, is the ratio of tetrahedral to octahedral sheets and some of the details about the space between. And so now we'll spend some time. We're going to talk about these. We're going to talk about kaolinite. We're going to talk about smectite, vermiculite, fine-grained mica, and chlorite. Now, the thing that separates these is the ratio of tetrahedral to octahedral. So kaolinite, one to one. There's a tetrahedral sheet and octahedral sheet. Then there's space. There's a tetrahedral sheet and so on. So it's the one to one. So this is the ratio of tetrahedral to octahedral. And that defines kaolinite. It's non-expanding, not swelling. The next one we'll talk about is the opposite almost. It's smectite. It's two to one. Two tetrahedrals to one octahedral. Two tetrahedrals to one octahedral. Repeat, repeat. Okay? A lot of water can get in here and, and split these things apart. Okay. Vermiculite, also two to one. Tetrahedral two, octahedral run. Tetrahedral two, octahedral run. Fine-grained mica, also illite as an example. Non-expanding, two to one. Tetrahedral, octahedral, tetrahedral. So it's getting pretty repetitive, right? Two to one, the ratio of tetrahedral to octahedral sheets. Okay. And then we move over to chlorite. Okay. And, and chlorite's unusual, it's two to one, but we, sometimes we say two to one to one. So we have the same two to one, tetrahedral, octahedral, tetrahedral, and there's a hydroxide sheet in between, tetrahedral, octahedral, tetrahedral. So, so this is a primary fundamental differentiator, the ratio of tetrahedral to octahedral sheets, and you can vision or picture each of these sheets as a ball and stick model, and now simply put as layers. Okay. And, and so that explains some of the properties. Okay. And so we look at kaolinite. So kaolinite has, is a relatively large, in terms of clay size, a relatively large colloid. Its external surface, meter squared per gram, 5 to 30. Okay? It's a one-to-one -one clay. There is no internal surface area. Okay? It doesn't swell. And it has an apparent CEC, cation exchange capacity, averaging around 8 centimoles of charge per kilogram. And this all uh, can be attributed to the way this is structured. So if I go back up to here to kaolinite, 
and look at the one-to-one -one tetrahedral octahedral, tetrahedral octahedral. What happens is this, this, the interlayer space is very tight and very fixed, and it's fixed because of hydrogen bonding between the octahedral sheet and the tetrahedral sheet. So there's no room for expansion. Uh, there's no expanding, there's no swelling, water, and so forth. So in terms of internal surface area, there's none. There's no extra space in here for attachment of water and cations. Pretty slick, and the simplest one-to-one -one silica clay. And as we build on with more and more layers, two-to-ones, the chemistry becomes a little more fascinating, and we start to add internal surface area. So if we think about that, let's go to our next clay type. Okay. and fine-grained mica, okay. fine-grained mica. And one of the fine-grained mica is illite. Okay. So this group is a two-to-one ratio, tetrahedral to octahedral. Okay. So we're basically looking at illite, smectite, two-to-one, two-to-one, okay. sorry, and no expansion. And so what happens in this fine-grained mica, it's a two-to-one, potassium is holding together. It's just about the right size to fit in the interlayers, and this attracts the tetrahedral sheets and kind of holds them together. So there's very little expansion, uh, essentially no expansion, the minimum swelling, and water doesn't get in here and doesn't split this apart. So the presence of potassium in these interlayer spaces uh, keeps it tightly together. Fine grain mica, two to one, potassium kind of bonding, electrostatically bonding the tetrahedral sheets together. Okay. So we think about that and then we run down our our properties. Okay? And so now we have fine grain mica. The external surface, meter square per gram, is a bit larger than kaolinite. And it's external surface. So this means that the specific surface is greater. And the reason is that it's a slightly smaller, you get smaller particle size. And so remember what happens as you decrease particle size and the diameter of these clays. The specific surface goes up tremendously. So this external surface represents all that specific surface on those smaller particles. Internal surface is pretty much zero. There is, they are bound together by potassium, held very tightly, and because of this, they don't expand, and eventually you weather out the potassium and make something else, but there's very little expansion and very little swelling, so the swelling is low. The apparent CEC, the measured CEC, is a bit higher. We have more surface area, more external surface area, and its average is 30 centimoles of charge per kilogram, and there's the range. So it's important. One of the things we'll want to remember from these, um, this graph, this is we'll want to, in this lower column with the CECs, we would like to keep together. Okay? And so one of the jobs after this lecture is to commit those to memory. Okay? Vermiculite, two to one expanding. Okay, so now we've gone from non-swelling and non-expanding to expanding. Same, now we get two to one, two tetrahedral, one octahedral. The external surface area for vermiculite is about the same, so the particle size isn't all that different on the average of fine grain mica. But look at the internal surface. Now we're going 600 to 700. So we, in terms of, of the relative amount of internal to external surface area, this, so to speak, blows away the amount of external surface area. So it adds a tremendous amount of surface area. The swelling capability is medium, and the CEC is 150 centimoles of charge per kilogram on the average, and there's a range. So that's quite a bit higher, okay? And that quite a bit higher is due to this internal surface area. So if I go back to the picture, and we look at vermiculite, it's two to one expanding. Again, two tetrahedrals to one octahedral. Water and other ions can get in here. There's a lot of space that's not tightly held, and there's expand, the interlayers expand. And, and there's some swelling. Okay. So all this internal surface area adds to the capacity to adsorb cations. Hence, we have an average of 150 centimoles of charge per kilogram. Okay. Pretty neat. A two-to-one clay, but it's expanding because there's nothing really holding it together. There's no potassium. Okay. There's no hydrogen bonding. The way these are held together, the water kind of acts as a, as a, as a, um, as a wedge. So the last one on this list for the mineral colloids, the, the phyllosilicates, is smectite. Smectite, a two to one as well. And the CEC, the external surface area, is just slightly higher range, so just a little bit smaller particle size. The internal surface is a little less than vermiculite. Okay. The swelling is very high, 
and the average CEC is a little lower. Very sensitive mouse, sorry about that. And, and so this, again, attributed to mostly, largely, to the structure. If we go back and see what that looks like. So let me bear with me while I take you back to the fundamental piece. And here we are at the smectite, 2 to 1 expanding. Okay? So now this expansion is greater than vermiculite. Okay? You get maximum swelling and slightly lower CEC. Uh, and part of the reason for that CEC the reason and change is that there's a little less um, negative charge expressed on these tetrahedral sheets and a little more on the octahedral sheets. That'll become apparent in a little while. Okay. What about organic? Okay. So organic, and I put this on its own level because it's, organic's very different and we saw that the focus in terms of where the charge in organic is very different. The, Hard carboxyl, uh, phenyl hydroxy, and alkyl hydroxy. And, and so the charge, the CEC is very different. And surface area is kind of difficult to think about in organic systems, but the CEC, the average CEC for these organic colloids is around 200. It's, it's, it's higher than anything in, mineral so in the minerals, and it's also a very high range. Okay? So organic colloids have a much higher CEC. And on the average, we think of them about 200 centimoles of charge per kilogram. And we'll see later that this is dependent on pH. So the story will become a little more complex. But for now, this 200 centimoles of charge per kilogram uh, of soil is um, it's, it's highest, it's the highest CEC that we have. Okay, now let's go to the silicate non-crystallines. Okay? And remember, we talked about aliphane and amogalite. And let's also add the iron aluminum oxides and hydroxides. You remember gibbsite, the aluminum hydroxide. And you'll remember gotite, the iron hydroxide, iron oxide. Okay? So gibbsite and gotite, we'll go first with them. They have the external surface area around 80 to 300, but they have no internal surface area. They do not swell, and they have a very low CEC, 4 centimoles of charge per kilogram. Okay? It's lower than kaolinite. Okay? And you'll note that's a range, so it's kind of odd. We have, you can have a net positive charge and all the way to minus five. So it's quite a range, and this is very dependent on pH. Now that's a bit confusing now, and we won't address that until we talk about um, pH-dependent charge. That's coming in the future. So if you'll just realize that these colloids, gibbsite and gotite, these highly weathered, um, these highly weathered non-silicate clays have a very low CEC and can have a positive CEC. Okay. And then we move to aliphane and amogalite. We talked about those from volcanic ash, volcanic soils, the uh, non-crystalline silicate clays, a relatively high external surface area, no internal surface area, no swelling, and, but a higher CEC. This is, and this CEC 30 is on the order of what we see for uh, illite, the fine grain mica. Okay? And it also can have a positive, net positive charge and that net positive charge largely due to pH. And again, the pH complicates the story, so for now, we'll just realize and memorize that the CEC for the aliphane and amogalite is about 30 on average, and the CEC for gibbsite and gotite, these highly weathered uh, soil, these highly weathered um, non-silicate colloids, is very, very low. So here's some pictures. So I took some pictures out of the Soil Science Journal and to contrast. And you'll see all of these have some degree of cracking. And, and so this degree of cracking, it's a function of two things. Right? It's a function of the amount of clay and the type of clay. So let's look out here in the lower right-hand corner. Not a, lot of, uh, not a lot of cracking and drying. Only 10% clay, but the clay is montmorillonite. So montmorillonite is one of these smectites, two to one high expanding clay. Okay? But there's not a lot of it. And because there's not a lot of it, even though it's a very expansive clay, we don't see these dry cracks in this particular soil. Okay? So let's contrast that with a high amount of montmorillonite. So here's a high amount of the montmorillonite clay, this 2 to 1 expanding clay. And we see a very large gap, very large cracks. And so this is a contrast. A lot of clay that's expansive clay, very, very big cracks, very little expansive clay a uh, very small amount of dry and cracking. Now let's look at kaolinite. Kaolinite, remember that was a what type? One to one. Okay, one tetrahedral to one octahedral sheet, tightly held together by hydrogen bonding, therefore it does not expand easily. There's very little internal surface area, 
and the physical, um, the physical reality of that reflects with a high amount of kaolinite, very little cracking. So 64% kaolinite doesn't look like a cracked soil clay, but 64% montmorillonite does. So here's high clay and illustrates the contrast of a low, a low activity clay, kaolinite, versus a high activity, high swelling clay, montmorillonite. We go over to our right hand corner and put 38% non phyllosilicate clays, okay? some of the amorphous and paracrystalline clays, and there's a medium amount, uh, uh, kind of a medium amount of cracking, nothing like you see with montmorillonite, and a lot more than you see um, with a little amount, with small amount montmorillonite. So this is a nice contrast showing the differences of the importance of the amount and type of clay on physical properties. And so that cracking is, is reflected in the built structure that we just talked about. That's pretty, pretty neat. We can understand our clays based on the ratio of tetrahedral to octahedral uh, units. We can, we can understand the internal surface area as it, adds to the, as, as it adds to the CEC. And then we can look at the physical properties. And, and now we have a background to think about exchange. So I want to go back to the ionic Helmholtz double layer. Okay? And so we've talked about this. We've defined it as the colloid as the balance of positive charges as the outer part of the layer and the negative charges. And, re and recall that we discussed this. This represents a, a clay, a phyllosilicate, if you will, or a colloid, and net negative charge expressed on the surface balanced by cations on the, uh, on the outside or adsorbed. Okay. So, so let's, let's throw some chemistry into here, and let's use carbonic acid. So carbonic acid, why use carbonic acid? Well, there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the soil. You take carbon dioxide and dissolve that in water, and you end up with carbonic acid. So carbonic acid, a very weak acid, but it dissociates. So H2CO3 is the formula. So it will dissociate into a proton, hydronium ion, actually H3O, but we'll illustrate, simply say H+, and a bicarbonate, HC3O-. So when we have carbonic acid, you'll generate an H plus and some HCO3 minus. Okay. It, now note, you don't generate H plus, H plus, and it's not carbonate, it's bicarbonate. So the anion balancing this is bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, not CO3 minus 2. Okay. So let's look at what happens when we introduce that to a system, a colloid where we have aluminum, calcium, potassium, sodium adsorbed on the surface, associated on a charged basis. And let's balance the reaction with three carbonic acids, three moles of carbonic acids. Okay. So carbonic acid dissociates. Now we have H plus and HCO3 minus. Sodiums are going to leave. So we're going to displace sodiums, which is the least strongly held, and we're going to replace those with hydrogens. And so we can do Monday night cations with John Madden and get the formula there in play. Okay. Sodiums in play going to the right. Hydrogens coming over to the left. Large amounts of applause. The crowds go wild. And voila, this is the end result. Those sodiums plus one have been replaced by plus one hydrogen, the cation exchange reaction. In the solution, we have sodium bicarbonate. Those sodiums were kicked off and went out into solution and balancing the bicarbonate anion. Okay. The hydrogen's here, the sodium's back here. And that's fairly simple balance, the balancing a cation reaction. That brings us to CEC cation exchange capacity. And so this was a picture of my cat before it weighed 200 pounds um, and no longer with us, but it was a very playful little kitty cat. So let's look at phyllosilicates. And so let's, let's kind of break this down. Clay micelle, okay? a crystal. So this is an illustration of a clay micelle, a crystal. And we can take that crystal apart. So if we look at that very closely, we'll see layers. Okay. We'll see layers and we'll see adsorbed cations in between those layers, okay, the inner layer spaces. 
and their oops, excuse me, very sensitive mouse, and, and they're balanced by their balancing the net negative charge expressed at the surface of these interlayer spaces. Okay. Clay micelle, attracting adsorbing cations. There's here's a soil solution, here are cations, and cations can exchange from the solution to adsorb. Okay. We have internal surface and the external surface. So let's think about cation exchange capacity. The sum of exchangeable cations a soil can absorb. We're reviewing what we've defined originally when we talk about what CEC is. Okay. And he says measure and use centimoles of charge per kilogram of soil. Okay. And the older measurement units, milli equivalents of charge per 100 grams of soil. Same ratio. This over this, milli equivalent over 100 grams is equal to centimole charge over kilogram. You multiply both by 1,000. So I guess we're coming to an interesting time that your chemistry will actually have some use. And I want to say, the first time I understood chemistry was when I took soil. So it was, it was, it was quite a blessing. Uh, and I'm still trying to understand chemistry. So let's now think about quantifying that. Okay, so how do we quantify cation exchange capacity? And after thinking about the leaching and positive cations and negative anions, we'll draw a picture of what's happening in the lab. So in the laboratory, we make a solution of ammonium plus. Uh, this week in lab, you'll actually use barium, uh, barium chloride and barium's a positive uh, cation, and you'll use it to do the same thing ammonium's doing. Okay? So we take ammonium, a very strong solution, one molar, and we drip that through the soil. Okay? So mass action, one molar is pretty high concentration. Right? And so by mass action, this, uh, this ammonium cation will displace all of these cations in the soil. Right? So anything, so these are cations adsorbed. There's calcium, there's potassium, there's magnesium, there's some aluminum and hydrogen. And so if we leach this through and flood the system with ammonium, we're gonna push out these positive cations and ammonium will take its place. And so if we think about what that would look like, in a cartoon, now all those sites where we had other cations are now occupied by ammonium. So they're balancing what calcium, there's two, cal two ammoniums here to balance that calcium. There's two magnesiums, to two NH4 pluses to balance the magnesium. There's one NH4 plus to balance the potassium. So it's a charge equivalent basis. And all these charges add up to the same as the sum of these charges. Now we have ammonium here, and in solution, all those displaced cations have been pushed out, and they are now in solution. Pretty cool. Now, if we had a way to measure this quantity of ammonium, we would have a way to estimate the cation exchange capacity, because now all the sites that were filled by cations are now filled only with ammonium, and if we could titrate this and get it back on a one-to-one -one basis, we would know the CEC. So that's the next step, is to push all these ammoniums out with a different solution, and this is a potassium solution. So if you have a high molar concentration of potassium and have the potassium push these out, collect all the ammonium in the bottom, and it would look something like this. Okay? There's the silis, these are all balanced, the same number of charges. Here we have the ammonium plus, and now all the ammonium that was here is now in here. And now, with a little bit of titration, if you can determine quantitatively how much ammonium you've collected, you can work your way back and know the charge. And so cation exchange capacity is operationally defined by this displacement, and it's pretty neat. Now we have a number, the concentration here for kilogram of soil, that's going to give us CEC. And this is essentially how it's done. So that's pretty neat, and I want to add a little more. So we're going to, in lab this week, we're looking at um, hydrogen replacement, and we're looking at humus, and we're looking at CEC. And one of the calculations we'll do will be to determine um, how much, how much each, each uh, percent of humus contributes to CEC. So we use a rule of thumb. Every percent increase in humus contributes two centimoles of charge per kilogram. Okay. And, and, and how do we know this? So let's, let's work it back with some calculations. Okay. Now we said that the CEC of organic matter is equal to 200 centimoles of charge per kilogram. You said that was the average. We said it ranged up to as high as 500, but this was the average number we were using. Okay. 
Now consider a kilogram of soil. And if 1% of that is humus, okay, that would be 1% of 1 kilogram or 0 0.01 kilograms of humus. Okay? That should be fairly straightforward. Now if we had 0 0.01 kilograms of humus and we estimated the CEC, it's 200 centimoles of charge per kilogram, that would give us 2 centimoles of charge. So this generalization comes from this fairly straightforward calculation of the amount of organic matter multiplied by the average concentration in terms of CEC. So a question, suppose I had a CEC of 300 centimoles of charge per kilogram. I got this organic matter, this organic colloid from a different part of the system where it was a higher pH and that would increase the, the charge. What is the contribution of organic matter? So I'll leave you to estimate the contribution of organic matter if you have 300 centimoles of charge per kilogram as the uh, CEC of organic matter. Okay. So be sure you can do this for the others. We've done kaolinite, we've done vermiculite, we've done smectite, illite, chlorite, so all, all, these, all these materials. And now it's important to keep in mind, so now we're adding one more thing to our toolbox. We're adding the average CECs of these different colloid types. We have organic matter, we have illite, we have smectite, vermiculite, kaolinite, chlorite, allophane, amogalite. So that's going to be one more thing to memorize. And on our next exam, we may ask you some of those details. So the bottom row of that table could be very helpful, will be very helpful, or could be harmful, but not for you because you will have studied it. So that's pretty neat. And so we start to think, well, you told us about the source of net negative charge on the organic colloids but you didn't really tell us where they come from on the phyllosilicates and the other ones. So, so let's explore that. Okay? Silicate clays, okay, the silicate clays, the phyllosilicates, the explanation for the net negative charge is isomorphous substitution. So you'll see how that's spelled, isomorphous substitution. Okay? So let, let's explore, this is a conceptual um, definition, a conceptual understanding, an explanation of why we see net negative charge on these surfaces. Okay. So consider if you have a structure and you have aluminum plus three, and suppose you put that aluminum plus three in a spot where silica plus four formerly was. Okay. If you substitute aluminum plus three for silica plus four, what happens in terms of the charge balance? Negative, right? You're adding a negative charge. You're putting plus three, and there's going to be an unsatisfied net negative charge. What happens if in magnesium plus two substitutes for an aluminum plus three? Okay. Same thing. Plus two, plus three, you'll have a net negative charge unaccounted for. Okay. What happens with the iron aluminum hydroxides? When you have exposed crystal edges, okay, there's some dissociation of hydrogen. They have a much lower CEC to begin with. So let, let's, let's take a picture of that. Here's a, a cartoon of an exposed crystal edge. Okay? This is aluminum hydroxide. There's no silica around. And at the edges, these hydroxides, there's some tendency of broken edges for dissociation of hydrogen. Okay? These are relatively large particles. There's not a lot of dissociation. So they have a very small CEC, and it's pH dependent. Okay. So the explanation for these exposed crystal edges on these iron aluminum oxides and hydroxides, this accounts for the CEC, okay. and that's why they're very small. Now going back to the silicate clays, aluminum substitutes for silica floor. So what layer is this happening, the aluminum? So what layer is the mainly built with um, silicon where aluminum would come in? And so that has to be the silica tetrahedral layer. So in the silica tetrahedral layer, if you drop in somehow an aluminum plus three and a silica plus four, you're adding a net negative charge. And do that enough and you can have a very high accumulation of net negative charge. In the aluminum octahedral layer, okay, if you bring in a magnesium plus two and fill that in a spot formerly occupied by aluminum plus three, you leave a net negative charge. And this is the underlying explanation, the thought, the explanation for net negative charge on these phyllosilicates. Okay, and that was the exposed crystal edges back to just contrast from the 
the um, highly weathered iron and aluminum oxides to the final silicates. Okay. So, so why substitution? And, and so it has to do with ionic radius size. And, and so this is ion. Okay, these are the ions. These are the radius in nanometers. And so in the silica tetrahedra, aluminum will substitute for silica. And the thing is, it's just about the right size. Okay? And sometimes iron will even substitute. So there are, there are substitutions, and these are observed through X-ray diffraction and, and some of those micrographs. And it's observed that aluminum is sometimes holding a place where silica would be in a silica tetrahedron, okay? leaving a net negative charge. We move down to the aluminum octahedron. And the most common substitution is magnesium plus two. Again, these similar sized atoms with atomic radii can fit in the spaces, and that's the explanation. They leave a net negative charge in the aluminum octahedron. And then you start to get very large, and all of these occur on the exchange sites. And so there's, these are too large to fit into those spaces. And now we're dealing with exchangeable cations. So let's do a practice quiz. So we've talked about net negative charge, some balance, um, and, and let's, let's do this. Let's balance this reaction and let's make it go all the way to the end. So you've got to balance, so you need to know the charge is coming off and the charge is coming on and nothing can be lost or gained, so everything has the balance here. So the first question is how many charges do we have? Okay. How many positive charges? So how would you do that? Calcium is what? Plus two? Potassium is what? Plus one? And so there's two, four, five. Two, four, five. So 10 so centimoles of charge per kilogram. So there's 10 centimoles of charge that will be balanced uh, by these cations that are adsorbed on this surface. Okay. So we add HCl. Okay. How much HCl do we have to add to move 10 of these off? So it must be 10. We've got to have 10 hydrogens. Okay. Because hydrogen is plus 1. Okay. Okay. So 10 hydrogens. These hydrogens go over here. They now replace the cations. And what's in solution? How do we finish this off? Okay. So we have chloride. But now we have potassium and calcium coming off. And so this exchange, as you tally these up, looks something like this. There's four calcium, one, two, three, four. Okay. There's two potassium. Calcium has a plus two, so chloride's only minus one, so you need CaCl2 and two KCl. So the question is, does that balance? So let's see, here is two, four, five, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Charges balanced. Here we have ten H's. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. And here we have ten chlorides. So here's two, and four times two is eight, ten. We have four calciums. So this all balances. So this equation balances. Um, we started with the number of charges. We then start the moles of material coming off, and then balancing the anions, and the job is finished. And yep, it checks out pretty nicely. Eight plus two, perfect. And 10 points on the exam. Now, what if we switch the acid? And let's use carbonic acid. Why carbonic acid? It's a weak acid. It is predominant in soil where we generate a lot of carbon dioxide. So for next time, when I return uh, from my trip, I will ask you on that Monday lecture to show me the answer to this question. Okay. Now, we're pretty comfortable now with this idea of net negative charge. And so I want to throw in a little bit of a monkey wrench and, and tell you about positive charges. Okay. And so it's possible to have a net positive charge. And this occurs under high acidity. Now, the mechanism may not be apparent until we talk about soil reaction next, um, next couple of weeks. But under conditions of high acidity, a lot of hydrogen around, you can actually get a net positive charge. What happens is the, common, uh, the excess of hydrogen 
will be attracted and will actually um, come over here to the OH and will be attracted and will lead to a net positive charge. There's so many hydrogens around. These will join with these OHs. Kind of interesting. High acidity, low pH, net positive charge of these iron aluminum oxides and hydroxides. So if you remember, back in our chart, we looked at the range of, of CEC. Okay? So these iron aluminum oxides, hydroxides, four, but they had a range of plus 20, okay, all the way down to a minus eight. So there's, there's quite a range. And, and so now that's this little fine piece that we, can, we add the story that pH influences this. And it's particularly true for the iron aluminum oxides and hydroxides, and particularly true for the, um, the, the andesol soils, the immogalite and allophane. They're, those charges are pH dependent. So we think back to those charges and high acidity, low pH, and we had the accumulation of hydrogens, attraction of hydrogens, and voila, now we have a net positive charge. Again, low pH, high acidity. So that underline that, low pH, high acidity. We can get on these iron aluminum oxides and hydroxides a positive charge. So that leads us to anion exchange. So anions, so remember, we've been focusing on cations, but if we have a net positive charge, if we represent this collet as a net positive charge, anions will be adsorbed to the surface. And here's an example showing nitrate, an anion, minus one, and exchanging with chloride, both minus one. So if we do an exchange with this, the chloride can replace the nitrate, and the nitrate can go into solution. So this is anion exchange, and what is it happening? It's happening under conditions of high pH, when we have a net positive charge on some of these colloids. What are those? Gibbsite, goatite, allophane, and amogalite. So recall these two are iron aluminum oxides. These are iron oxides. Allophane is an aluminum hydroxide. And amogalite also, these non-crystalline silicates. And here we have these highly weathered uh, iron aluminum oxides and hydroxides. Pretty amazing. So, so the last part of this story is the strength of attraction of cations. Okay? And, and you'll demonstrate, you'll understand this in lab this week as we add some of these different cations to clay. So the different cations have a different strength of attraction to these surfaces. And it has to do with the charge density. And we think about charge density, we're talking about two things. We're talking about the valence, the charge, and the hydrated radius. So all of these ions, all these cations, they aren't by themselves, they travel with a shell of water. And so when they move around with a shell of water, there's a certain hydrated radius. And so if we look at aluminum, aluminum is very high valence, okay? It draws the water in very tight, so it has a very small hydrated radius. So the charge density is very high. Okay? As we go down to calcium, plus two, it's a little it's lower valence, it still draws water in, but it's a little less tight, but still a relatively large hydrated radius and a, rel a little less charge density. Okay? And then as we move down to magnesium, the charge density is a little less, potassium and ammonium about equal, and then sodium even lower. In fact, the charge density is so low for sodium that we take advantage of it and we use sodium as a dispersant when we're trying to do our clays settling. So recall back in the soil texture lab, and you added a dispersant. We wanted to keep the clays in solution and keep them apart. If the clays clumped together and jumped down, we wouldn't be very successful in measuring the specific gravity to trying to measure what the clays were because they would drop out. So we needed the clays in solution. How do we keep them in solution? We added sodium hexametaphosphate. We put that in the blender for about five minutes, and that sodium hexametaphosphate, that sodium cation, was responsible for maintaining the dispersion of those clays. It's weakly held and maintained a net negative charge. So that's kind of neat. That, that's kind of neat, a practical application, and now we're just now getting to the chemistry understanding of that. Okay. So, so how do you overcome this? And, and you overcome it by mass action. And what is mass action? Mass action is taking a very high concentration and flooding the system. So when we did those cation exchange reactions, we use ammonium, NH4 plus ammonium chloride, ammonium salt, or ammonium acetate, 
And the high concentration of ammonium, even though NH4 plus is not as tightly held as aluminum or calcium or some of these others, the sheer concentration of it fr freed those um, ions, those cations, from the exchange sites and just overwhelmed the system. And that, that's mass action, a very high concentration just overwhelming the system. Here's a nice illustration okay, of that. So here, root exuding roots push out, they pump out hydrogen and that gets involved with the exchange of cations and the colloid. So here's a picture of a micelle. Okay? And, and so if you have a micelle with a relatively high CEC, and if you surround it by sodium, potassium, and these ions, these are only plus one. Okay? These have large hydrated radius and small balance, so the charge density is small. So you can't get enough sodiums around this to completely, to completely counter the charge. Now suppose instead of sodium in solution, we use aluminum. Aluminum's plus three, so it, and it also draws the water in very tight. So the charge density is much greater, and you can put enough aluminum around here with their water shell to totally counteract the electrostatic, to totally counteract the attraction of this micelle. So totally, totally counteract this net negative charge. And now in solution, if you put aluminum in solution, and counteract this net negative charge, there's nothing keeping these apart, and these clay micelles tend to run into each other and settle out the bottom. If you have sodium in solution, there's a tendency to keep these in solution. They keep repelling each other, and they don't fall out. So here's the situation for our texture analysis, and here's the situation that you're examining in lab this week, seeing what happens when you add aluminum chloride to a solution of bentonite, which is a smectitic clay. Pretty cool, so lad this week fills in nicely. And, and think about that mass action. One ammonium, one normal, oops, sorry, one normal chloride, okay? How much centimoles of charge does that produce? What is one normal? So I'm going to leave you with that question to think about, and we'll, I'll ask you what your answer is on Monday. Okay. So we have the clays, we have the chemistry, and probably the last, getting near the end of the line, is talking about the genesis. How are they made? Okay. So there are several ways. So one of the ways to make a silicate clay is to alter primary minerals. And what are the primary minerals? We have already reviewed them, those minerals that have both aluminum and silica. And we went through a number of those. I think we did that the first, uh, the first week or two of lecture when we talked about parent material, probably the second week. Another way to make clays is to have a complete breakdown and recrystallization of primary minerals. Very high intense weathering, completely destroyed, destruction, synthesis of new clays. So that, that's quite a range. So we can think about this then in a weathering sequence from rather gentle weathering to rather intense weathering. Let's look at this picture from the text, the charges on clay colloids. Okay? And so we have mild weathering intensity. That would be a fairly mild temperature, not a lot of precipitation, all the way to a very strong, a very strong intense weathering. Um, so what would that be? That would be high temperature, high humidity in the tropics, and intermediate, somewhere in between. So if we look at the charges on clay colloids, centimoles of charge per kilogram, the cation exchange capacity of these slightly weathered clays is relatively high. Right? And as we move down and we increase the weathering, the cation exchange capacity lowers quite a bit. And as we get to the mostly iron aluminum oxides, these highly weathered clays, uh, in these intensely weathered systems, we actually have a very low CEC, and it becomes even positive when you have a, pot, um, a high pH, sorry, a low pH. So this weathering intensity um, kind of makes sense based on CEC, and it kind, of, it kind of puts together, it comes together with how we describe these as being, as being formed. And, and let's look at that. So the primary aluminosilicates, some are high in clay, some are high in magnesium, microline, orthoclase, muscovite. We talked about all those. Okay? And this will be, be the last thing I'll say before I wrap it up, is that you can alter these just by a little bit of minor weathering. Okay? 
And, and if you alter these and make them smaller and just remove a little bit of a K from muscovite and micas, you'll get fine grain mica. Okay? If you keep weathering that, remove K from the fine grain mica, you'll get vermiculite. And if you weather that a little more, you can get chlorite. So this is relatively mild weathering. Okay? You can weather that more intensely and get to smectite. And you can weather, remove the silica and get the kaolinite and remove more silica and get to the oxides of iron aluminum, of iron aluminum. So very intense weathering, very light weathering, and a combination of processes, removing silica all the way in these hot, dry, hot, wet climates with the iron oxides and aluminum. And this kind of fits together with what we talked about in the past. Um, yes, that's, that kind of wraps up a good portion of the clays. Next week, we'll put this together, we'll summarize and, um, and get you ready for lab. This week in lab, you'll be looking at this, so refer to these notes. There are some perhaps questionable things still rough in your mind. Use the textbook and refer to the web. That should be an awesome lab. So I wish you well, and I'll see you when I get back from the moon. <laughs>